Good afternoon, all my friends. You I have a loose relationship with time, <laughs> and that might be part of my part and parcel with my personality and my culture. Um, but it's also because it, I just can't stop saying hi to friends, and I think that's what we're all about. So it's just so thrilling to see one person after another who, who I know or I'm going to get to know. I'm going. So it's my job, as you might see in the program. I'm Stevie Lishin, and I co-coordinate the Mammoth Center for World Religion with Reverend Liz Congdon, who's sitting there next to my husband, Robert Smith. <laughs> um, maybe I should start with all the members, the board members of the Mammoth Center for World Religions. If you could stand just for a brief moment, no applause are even necessary, so you can um, recognize some of us. And, okay, you can sit. <laughs> um, our, our names are on um, our brochure. We hope you, um, this is one of all, all the programs that we're going to, um, that we present. We have a, a, a new website that we are very proud of, and um, tell, we'll tell you about our, who we are, former programs, upcoming programs, um, some of what brings us all together here. Um, I don't think a day goes by where I'm not, but I don't feel like pinching myself at, um, Mammoth, at about the Mammoth Center for World Religions and how unique we are in that there are many, many interfaith programs, thank goodness, all over the world, all over the country, even some in New Jersey. However, I do not think that any represent as broad a spectrum of faith and cultural traditions. And it's just something wonderful. We wouldn't be here if we weren't originally organized by um, Dr. Roshan Chada and a um, few other important people who met together with him. And this day today um, is in remembrance of his mother and um, his sister. Subash, Dr. Subash Chada, did I get that close to her? Sister-in-law, I'm sorry, sister-in-law. His brother's here, but his sister-in-law is going to. And several um, Chada family members are here, come every year and offer us just one more amazing learning experience. Dr., um, no, let's see, who do I have? I'm just going to introduce um, Sarah Fischel, who is the um, board president of this amazing congregation that is so generous and invites us to um, and welcomes us to um, share and use the space so that we can offer what, a sampling of what we're doing here today. Um, I want to mention that after this program, we have delightful treats waiting there. It's very important for us to have programs. I think equally, in my own opinion, maybe more important is what comes together with the programs, and that's the dialogue that we have. So please join us in the room that's like right in there for um, a beautiful display of snacks. I think you're next, and then um, Mata, you'll just come when it's your turn. Right? <laughs> Thank you. If you saw me cringe there, it was because of a cricket. You'll have to excuse oh. our cricket infestation today. <laughs> At any rate, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Monmouth County. Um, as Stevie said, I'm Sarah Fischel, and I currently serve as our congregation president. <clears throat> I was so happy to learn that today is the 12th annual Shanti Lecture. Um, it is sponsored, as you know, by the World Reli Monmouth Center for World Religions and Ethical Thought. Our congregation takes great pleasure in supporting the work of the Mammoth Center 
as it seeks to promote acceptance of religious and cultural diversity. And we applaud your mission in seeking common ground and promoting interfaith dialogue. I hope that everyone enjoys today's lecture. And now I turn the program over to Mata. Well, good afternoon and welcome again. Uh, I'm Madhav Fadke, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Swaminathan. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan has been a student of uh, Pooja Swami Dayananda Saraswati for about 20 years. He has attended many of the Vedantic, or which is uh, the uh, scriptural camps. Uh, that are held at the Arshavidya Gurukulam. And that's an institution, ashram, founded by Swami Dayananda Saraswati in Sailorsburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, if you get a time, go visit there. It's a beautiful facility, and there are many, many nice spiritual programs that are open to everybody. Uh, he has been conducting, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Swaminathan has been conducting Swamiji's Bhagavad Gita home study classes at his home, as well as Vedantic classes at his home uh, for the last uh, 14, 15 years. He has authored several uh, books. Uh, one of them is 365 Quotes of Swami uh, Dayananda Saraswati, which is Day After Day with Swami Dayananda Saraswati. That's the title of that. He is also uh, compiled many of uh, Swamiji's lectures and others in a book called Satyam and Mithya. And I try to translate it in, in English. Satyam is truth and Mithya means illusion. It will be beautiful reading for everyone. Uh, another one is, what you love is the pleased self. Self means yourself. And that's really the topic of today's, kind of focus of today's presentation. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan will discuss and describe to us how meditation can give you a realization that you are the source of happiness yourself. And uh, in addition to, with all the uh, spiritual work that he does, uh, he also leads Aim for Seva, a uh, social service organization. And on another part of his life, uh, he is a physical scientist by profession. Uh, he is a fellow of IEEE and a fellow of the Electromechanical, Electrochemical Society of America. Okay, let's welcome Dr. Swaminathan. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's it. Okay, excuse me. I think you know what? Hello, and thank you for taking me on. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Subhash Chadha, daughter-in-law of Chadha family, and I'm honored to say a few words about Srimati Shanti Chadha, my mother-in-law. I remember Bhabi Ji, a woman who embodied um, Hindu religious traditions dutifully with a little touch of modernity on occasions such as weddings, birth of grandchildren, and other Hindu festivals, she would arrange to have a priest, Pandaji, um, at home, conduct the puja at home. The priest would perform havan, a sacred fire, lit in a small urn, among the chants of Vedic verses and devotional songs and prayers. The whole occasion would become a celebration of family, friends, and life religion being the central force behind it. She brought religion into her home, where everyone participated. 
This event would be followed by an abundant vegetarian feast prepared with love and joy. I'll remember her setting up the tables and having the staff in the household cook all night before mornings would come and everybody will be preparing the vegetables, the puris, and the tons and tons of food prepared and laid on the table. That is my fond memories because my children say, you love food, mom. And, <laughs> and I would fall asleep while eating. <laughs> she valued, um, besides that, her religion and family, she valued the education of her children the most. And I remember her commitment to educating her children as they were growing up became her second passion. And some of, uh, she sacrificed some of her dreams so that her children would achieve those dreams. And I remember when Roshan Bhaisab decided to settle in America, that was the dream she thought the oldest son will be with her and settle in India. So she was quite touched, but again, she really wanted Roshan Bhaisab to progress, grow with Alan once they got married. And then we came to this country, so half of our children became citizens of United States and brought another part of her family to this country, made our country again. My remembrance of Bhabiji is a grand lady he, who, who lived her life with a sense of devotion, duty towards her family and religion, and an eye towards the future. She was a woman ahead of her time. And along the same lines, I have to say a few words about my father-in-law, Sri Sri Ram Chadda. I adored him. He was the force behind her back, and their partnership was unique on those times. And my father-in-law, uh, Bauji, we used to call him. He was in Masters of Mathematics. I remember my husband just reminded me in those days. So education was the most important part of their partnership, which they achieved. When I became the bride, new bride and came to the family, he wanted to know about my medical background. He was very excited that I'll open my maybe clinic in Merit, but it didn't happen. But still, he was very proud and excited about having a daughter-in-law who was educated as much as his sons. So I was very pleased and, and just fond of him. And I hope, as a daughter-in-law, I have contributed and continue to contribute to their legacy. Today, some of their grandchildren and great-grandchildren are here to celebrate their life. Thank you. गणपतिहम अवामहे कवीन कवीनाम उभमश्रवस्तमम जेष्ठराजम ब्रह्मनाम ब्रह्मनस्पद आनशुन्वन भूदे विश्री तसाधनम ओम महा घनादि पदये नमः सदा शिव समारंभाम शंकरा चार्य मध्यमाम अस्मदा चार्य पर्यंताम वंते गुरु परम पराम ओम सहना वावतु सहना उभुनक्तु सह वीर्यम करवा वहे तेजस्विना भदी तवस्तुमा विद्विशा वहे हे ओम शांति 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 हे नमस्कार एंड गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू सो एट द वेरी आउटसेट I would like to thank the World Congregation of Religions, the Chadda family, and Dr. Madhav 
for inviting me here and to share with you some insights about meditation. You can all hear me well? Okay. Now the talk is going to be for roughly about 40-45 minutes and we will also do a practice session of meditation perhaps for about maybe 10 minutes. And Dr. Jain will help me to move the slides. So he might go to the next slide. The word meditation in Sanskrit is called dhyanam. It is a manasakriya or mental activity. Activities are threefold. Activities done by the physical body, kayikam karma. Activities such as what I am doing right now, speaking the oral, vachikam karma. Then there is a third activity, activity centered on the mind, manasakriya. A manasakriya, or I should say, a special type of manasakriya is called meditation. We will see as we go along what is special about it. It is an act, a mental act, to spend quality time with oneself. In these days of hectic activities around us, we rarely spend quality time with oneself. Of course, in the usual parlance, we talk about quality time with children, quality time with spouses, the, spou the spousal partner, but we rarely talk about quality time with oneself. If one doesn't spend quality time with oneself, I doubt whether there will be any quality in the time that they spend with their children, with their friends, with their spouses and so forth. So that's so important. It is an act to be with oneself, to know more about oneself and in fact to discover oneself. What is the discovery? The discovery is that one is the source of happiness. So that is the introduction of this topic and we will see as we go along how this makes sense. Dr. Jain, thank you. If you investigate inquire into the human pursuits in general, there is a verse or part of a verse from a very famous text written by Adi Shankara many centuries ago called Viveka Chudamani. Viveka Chudamani means the crown jewel of discrimination, discriminative knowledge, viveka. Therein he says, in the beginning of the text itself, this is the first verse, part of the first verse, jantu nam narajanma durlabham. Among the possibilities of various births, it is a blessing, it is a rare thing, it is a, in fact a blessing to be born as a human being. 
a human being with a, with a discriminative, with the unique faculties of discrimination and choice or free will. This particular aspect distinguishes the humans from other living beings such as animals. The existence of a human is not merely bodily survival. Animals are programmed predominantly to take care of themselves, to eat, to drink, and they have a modicum of self-awareness, if you will, or self-consciousness, so that they can continue breeding their species. A dog has that level of self-awareness to know another dog. It can recognize it. But in a human being, the self-consciousness, the self-awareness, is total, it's hundred percent. That hundred percent self-awareness, self-consciousness, while it is a blessing, it also brings with it a baggage. The self-aware, self-conscious human being, because of that hundred percent total self-consciousness, also brings in self-judgment, recognizes the limitations, limitations erroneously assumed to be centered on oneself, and thereby looks for various pursuits to make that limitation go away, to make the person complete, to make the person full. The very essence of human life or human endeavor, if you examine very closely, everyone is after certain ends, to meet certain ends. And those ends are all invariably undertaken to make oneself happy. No one has to be told that being full and happy is a desirable thing. In one occasion, Puji Swamiji did this experiment in an audience such as this. He made a statement, almost axiomatic, that the purpose of all hu human pursuits is towards happiness. No one would want to say that I don't want to be happy. And he said, ask this, post this question to an audience such as this. Is there anyone in the audience, raise your hands, who do not want to be happy? He didn't expect anybody to raise their hands. This was more a rhetorical question. But lo and behold, somebody put out, there's one, one person put out a hand. Swamiji was august, because he didn't expect that. He just formulated the question to make everyone to understand the principle, but suddenly this person puts out a hand. And he, but nevertheless, since somebody said, so he said, sir, why do you put out your hand? I don't want to be happy. Why is that? Because that what makes me happy. You understand? That's, that is the human pursuit. All desires, all human pursuits, culminate in this one central theme. The purpose of any human pursuit is to arrive at the pleased self. But to arrive at that pleased self, what normally we do is we look for happiness outside. That is where we start our life's journey. 
And how do we do that? We try to maximize, or a better word would be to manipulate, three things. Those three are listed there. Upadhi. Upadhi means whatever the body, the mind, and the senses that we are endowed with, make them perfect so that the outside happiness is to the fullest extent. Sensory pleasures, bodily pleasures, etc. We want to manipulate the objects of pleasure, vishaya. We want to make everything in the right place. Then only we are happy. Then loka. Loka means time and place. We want to adjust the time and place as well to make ourselves happy. But however hard a human tries to maximize these three situations, one is inevitably going to discover the defects, the inherent defects in these three processes. What are those defects? Dukkha Mishritatvam, meaning it is an almost an universal law that there is no happiness that is not mixed with sorrow at some point in time. I had a physician doctor, a doctor who was in uh, pain management. So he used to advertise, there is no gain without pain and we take care of that pain. This is his advertisement. He's a pain management specialist. Dukkha Mishri Tattva. Everything is mixed with sorrow at some point in time. Adripti Karatva. One, one gets wary of all these sensory pleasures at some point in time or other. If I like sweets, then after a while, when I discover that I have diabetes, the same sweets, it's not going to be something that I look for. Adripti Karatvam. The last one is very important. Anityatvam. They are not long-lasting. They are just ephemeral. So this is the status of affairs, but the quest for happiness continues. No matter how many times we fail, this quest for happiness continues. But in this one important point, human beings are not going to settle for anything less than a happiness which is nityananta sukham, vimalam sukham, suvimalam, any happiness that doesn't have even an iota of adulteration by any misery or any sorrow. 100% happiness. It doesn't require a rocket scientist to also discover that that happiness is not outside. A question can be posed, is happiness a state of mind? Because we do not say that this is happiness, but we say, I am happy. This is a very interesting question. Is this a state of mind? Anything which is a state of mind is experiential in nature. If I like a nice scoop of ice cream of a flavor that I like, I enjoy it when I have that ice cream, that happiness is experiential. But that experiential happiness is not going to satisfy one of the conditions, namely that it is permanent. Experience or experiences are in time. They will disappear in time. So is this a state of mind? A question to be settled. Happiness is not an object 
which is quite obvious. So the question that a discriminative mind will ask is, if happiness is not outside, yet I seek happiness, I'm not going to settle for anything other than that. All my pursuits are towards gaining that happiness. The question is, if the quest is there, there must be a solution. And could that solution be a possibility? Is the happiness centered on oneself? The scriptures, the Hindu scriptures from the Vedas, which is at the end of the Veda, called Vedanta, also known as Upanishads, it gives the following message. There is a natural urge to be happy, because no one complains that I am happy. You do not go and convey your condolence or consolation to somebody who is celebrating. You don't go and ask, why are you so happy? What happened to you? How can you be? Nobody says that. You congratulate. Natural urge to be happy. What is natural is not a matter for complaint. If I can't stand sorrow and misery and agitation and unhappiness, my nature must be peace and happiness, happiness and peacefulness. If my nature is that, how come I do not know? So the problem is one of self-ignorance which can be corrected only by self-knowledge. The nature of the self is happiness. Now, if you say that the nature of the self is happiness, this poses or brings up, raises this following important question. The question is, who is the self? The meaning of self, the content of I, the pronoun I is the most interesting pronoun. When I say you, you can be you, 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 you. It can apply to anybody. He, she, it are also like that. But this pronoun, I, only I can say it. Similarly, you, when you say I, it is very specific. The self, the meaning of I, that self. What is that? We use the, you know, you can actually, this is a, a good spiritual practice. From waking up in the morning till you go to bed, you keep a counter of how many times you say I. I did it. I made the breakfast. I went to work. I telephoned. Just keep a counter, the I counter. That is the counter with which, that is the word, that is the, that is the principal word, the operating word, if you will. That is how we interact with the world. Whatever I take myself to be, whatever the meaning of I that I have, that is how I interact with the world, that is how I judge the world, and that is how I judge myself too. Very important word. And there is no one unique as this I is anywhere else. This is the unique I. Yet, we do not know what that I means. This is perhaps you might say, if you will allow me to say it, this is one of the tragedies of life. We spend the life, a lifetime, without knowing what that I is. The 
if you, if you want to analyze this problem further, the Vedantic scriptures boils it down to the fundamentals. And this is a very interesting analysis. If you look at the entire universe, known and unknown, the entire universe, without any exception, can be reduced to just two things. What is me and what is not me? What is I, the Sanskrit word is aham, and what is not me is idam, this, the object. I objectify, whatever I objectify, it is not me. I objectify this books, I objectify this building, I objectify all, all of you. I objectify the sun and the moon and the stars. I objectify the galaxies. I objectify time and space. Whatever that I objectify belongs to the category idam, this or that. Even you might say a black hole. The concept of a black hole, I the objectify. What I objectify is not me. So we have only two things in this world. Me and what is not me. When I see a mountain, I enjoy the mountain, I objectify the mountain, it's an object of my awareness, consciousness. In that mountain which I enjoy, I do not have the eye sense. I enjoy, I objectify waterfalls, I do not have the eye sense. I enjoy a blue sky, I do not have the eye sense. I enjoy a full moon on a beautiful autumnal night. I do not have the eye sense. Whether the object is tangible or not tangible, it doesn't matter. Because I objectify time and space and anything that exists in the purview of time and space, I objectify. When I do not have the eye sense in the mountain that I objectify, in the waterfalls that I objectify, in the blue sky that I objectify, in the autumnal moon that I objectify, but yet there are some places where Notwithstanding the fact that I objectify them, I make the mistake of having the I sense. The I sense is erroneously placed in a few things, such as the body. I objectify my own body. When I say you, 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 what I say, what I really mean is all this ensemble of bodies that are collectively present here are objects of my knowledge, my awareness. That's what I mean by you. The, obje the body that I objectify, I objectify my body. It belongs to not the aham category. It belongs to the other category idam category, because it is objectified by me. Yet, I make a mistake because of a certain 
seemingly an apparent association. How does this manifest? Because when I have the eye sense in the body, suppose if I ask, who are you? Or I would say, I am tall. The body is tall. Body is six feet, whatever. But I say, I am tall. And sometimes I am proud also that I am six feet tall. If six and a half is even better, then I can be a basketball player. I say that I am white, I am black, I am brown. I tell you, hope you won't mind my saying it. The whole cosmetic industry is based on that mistake. They mint millions of dollars, billions of dollars, in fact, is because of this erroneous identification of placing the eye in the body. That's why we have plastic surgeons. Lo and behold, that's not the only place where I make the mistake. Sometimes if, you, if one makes the mistake consistently, it is correctable. But the mistake is not made consistently because this placement of error, the locus of the error, keeps changing. I associate myself with the physiological functions, such as when I say I'm thirsty, I am hungry. It is one thing to say I'm thirsty and hungry from a transactional perspective. But to identify with that is an error. I identify with the mind. I say I'm loving, I'm angry. It's purely an agitation of the mind, but I associated myself with that. That's why I go to a psychiatrist, thinking that he or she will cure me. But he or she will also have the same identification. When I go visit the psychiatrist, I'll be the one on the sofa. When he goes home, then he will be on the sofa. He will have the same issues. Intellect. I say I'm a knower. I am a hearer. I am a seer. I am a thinker. Identification with the intellect. But the point to be noted is, I, the subject, which objectifies all these functions, is not any of this, nor it is a composite of any of this. Only when the I is looked upon from a particular standpoint, which can be objectified, but yet there is a mistake that is made. So the eye, the eye sense that I have now is misplaced in a few places. Either it is the body, depending upon what time of the day it is, or it's in the mind, or in the physiological functions, or in the intellect. Then who is this eye? It is not any of this. Because all this are objectified by the subject. The subject can never be the object. Extend this a little bit beyond the body. The body-mind sense complex. I play many different roles, depending upon the situation, each situation evokes in me a particular role. I am a daughter or a son with a reference to my father or mother. I am a sibling, brother or sister with a reference to the siblings. I am a husband or a wife. I am a citizen of a country. I am an employer or an employee. 
So these roles, many roles that I play, but the discovery is all these roles, no matter how um, special that role is, are all situations which are with reference to a certain framework that role is assumed. That means the role is me, but I am not the role. You know, if you see an actor, an actor acting as a beggar, he will be doing a wonderful job of begging, the act of begging. Everybody will congratulate, my God, what an act you provided. The begging that you did was so, so realistic. But inside, that actor will know that he is not the beggar. He knows that for that begging acting, he is going to get ten million dollars from Hollywood. Is he a beggar? No. The role is the actor, but the actor is not the role. The person is the role. The role is the person, but the person is not the role. So this is the Vedic mathematics. Dr. Jain is a mathematician. So here it is A is B, but B is not A. Clarity, there is confusion in self-identity, therefore there is clarity in self-identity is required. Body is me, I am not the body. Mind is me, but I am not the mind. Intellect is me, but I am not the intellect. Then what is I? I is the awareful, conscious being, unrelated to anyone or anything. It is self-evident and it is self-existent. The evidence of anything becomes evident to the self-evident consciousness. The existence of anything is proven to the self-existent, self, the self-existent, awareful, conscious being. The I is always the subject. It never is the object. Be even to say that it is the subject is aupacharikam. It's just to say something. Because the I is the, not only the content of the object, but it's also the content of the subject. The Upanishads teach that self is the nature of ananda, fullness, happiness. It is free from all limitations, free from the limitations of time, free from the limitations of space. You might ask, how is this possible? There is a window of an experience in our daily life that gives that insight, yes, it is possible. In our deep sleep, when I go to sleep, when you go to sleep, in the deep sleep state, the mind resolves. There is no mind. There is no body. There is no time. There is no space. Yet, I exist. Because when I wake up in the morning, I could say that I slept. I slept happily. So every day's experience gives a window of opportunity to get this insight about that I, that I is free from the vagaries, the bounds of time and space. It is limitlessness. It is that fullness is what I seek. Because of self-ignorance, I take myself to be different from that because of the various erroneous mistakes I made. It's also our daily experience. In a moment of happiness, this dichotomy, this dipole, subject-object, this duality resolves. Suppose let me share with you a joke. There was a person 
who was afraid of cats? I mean, who, I'm sorry, who thought that he was a cat? He took upon himself that he is a cat. So he will never come out because he was afraid of the street dogs that they will chase him. So he undergoes treatment, goes to the psychiatrist, several days of treatment, the psychiatrist shows him a mirror and then he also has a cat next to him, shows the mirror, who do you see? Then he shows them, puts the cat in front of the mirror, what do you see now? Oh, that's a cat. Who do you see now? Shows the mirror to him. Oh, I see myself. So, that's not you, right? Yes. No, no, I'm not the cat. So, this treatment goes for several weeks. The fellow is cured. He goes home. Psychiatrist is very happy. He is also happy that I'm cured. But still, he doesn't come out of the house. Psychiatrist calls him. Yeah, I thought we cured your problem. You are not a cat. We, we settled that matter. How come I heard that you are not still coming out of the house? Then this fellow says, Doctor, what is this? I thought you were an intelligent doctor. You cured me? Yeah, I know I'm not the cat, but how do the street dogs know that I'm not the cat? <laughs> you see, in this moment of laughter, in this moment of this laughter, for this joke, there is collapse of subject-object. Because you are able to suspend in that moment of happiness all whatever problems that you have back at home. You still have an unpaid mortgage. You still have a mother-in-law to deal with at home. You still have a boss, an in incongruent, arrogant boss at work. You have so many, you have a body pain, you have a back pain, you have a knee, knee pain, you have joint pain, all kinds of problems. None of those problems are solved. But doesn't matter. In that instantaneous moment where you laughed, you were able to suspend all the external effects and at that moment of laughter, you are with yourself. One has to discover that and extend it. Extend it means you don't need a joke to be that. Discover that space, discover that interval, Discover that incidental attributes of all these other problems, yet untouched, unadulterated, you are able to be with yourself. Next. This subject-object collapse of that subject-object resolution illustrates that the one absolute reality that is what one has to reckon with. There is a triangle on the slide. There are three things on the corners of the triangle. The individual, that is you, I, the individual. The creation consisting of the objects, universe, galaxies, what have you. And if you would allow me, there is a cause of that creation, the creator, who is responsible, who not only creates but sustains, if you want, you might say the Lord, the cause of the creation. But the Upanishads tells that there is only one absolute reality, which is the reality of the individual, the reality of the universe that the individual confronts and the reality of even the Creator. And that is known as Sat, existence that can never be negated, Chit, consciousness and Ananda, fullness, without 
the limitations of time and space. Now this is what the content of self I. And to know this, this is knowledge, it's purely cognitive. And that knowledge takes place in the mind, the mind has to be prepared. Only knowledge can take place in a prepared mind. Meditation is one of the steps to achieve a prepared mind, particularly it gives the chitta ega grata, the one-pointedness of the mind. So now I'm coming to the subject matter. Meditation is not something that you can sit down and do. There are qualifications. You start somewhere, of course, with some qualifications, then doing meditation, it enhances those qualifications. There are three. One is called samatva, meaning a relative poise during day-to-day -day life. Vairagya, being objective and clear about priorities in life. Atma Viswasa, some relative self-esteem and self-confidence. These are three minimum qualifications for doing meditation. Next slide. Preparation for meditation. We will do a practice at the end. There are two processes, two preparation, prepara preparatory processes. One is physical preparation, and in the next slide I will show the mental preparation. Physical preparation, choosing a place of meditation. At a minimum, a quiet place. You can't sit on the roadways of Garden State Parkway and then hope to meditate. So you need a quieter place. Asana, that is the sitting posture. And also the seat itself, both are called asana. Asyate iti asana, that is where you sit. Asyate anena prakarena iti asana, by the method with which you sit, the posture, both are asana. The seating should be neither too soft, sthira, sukha, asana. It should be neither too soft nor too hard. It should be sukham, it should be comfortable. And sthiram, a sthiram means a posture, a seat in which you can sit for a length of time, the time that you do the meditation, comfortably. And we say in the Sastra, in the scriptures, if you can sit in a posture for one muhurta, that means 48 minutes, you have what is known as asana siddhi. You have accomplished that capability to sit. That is a great practice to have. The ability to sit in a posture undisturbed for a length of time. Samam kaya shiror grivam. The body should be kept straight. The illustration on the right shows that. Sama means equal. Three things should come straight. Kaya the body, shira the head, and griva the neck. So when you sit, all those three should be vertically aligned. Keep the exhalation and inhalation equal. Prana, panau, samau, kritva. The inhalation and the exhalation process, we will do the practice later. It should be the breathing, the inhaling and the exhaling should be equal, samam. Eyes totally closed or partially closed. The idea is that they do not concentrate on anything particular. It's like equivalent to unfocusing. It's not particularly focused on any object. So that's the meaning of eyes closed or partially closed. 
These are the physical preparatory steps. The next slide. I have the mental preparation. Withdraw the mind from all external objects. Give up the guilt regarding the past and anxieties regarding the future. That means you are with the present moment. Seren temporarily surrender. If you can surrender permanently, that'll be great. Temporarily surrender all your interest at the feet of the Lord and dwell in the present. The picture of the Buddha, this is a statue of Buddha, it is shown here purposely, which we will, I will highlight it in the practice. Look at his eyelids. We will, I will, so just remember that when we do the practice, you can make the connection, I will make the connection. Next, process of meditation. There are certain definitions here. A constant flow of similar thoughts centered on the object of meditation, undisturbed by any other extraneous thoughts not connected to that object of meditation. Vijatiya pratyaya anantarita sajatiya pratyaya pravaha. Sajatiya means the every cognitive movements, every cognition is on the same object of meditation. If another cognition comes, you bring the mind back to the object of meditation. And the bringing back the mind from its chosen object of meditation is called actually meditation. Three other steps, dharanam, dhyana, and Samadhi. In the Yoga Sastra, it's called Sanyama. Dharana, holding the mind on the object of meditation. Dhyanam, attempt to retain the mind on the focused object. Samadhi, absorption of the mind in the object of meditation. Next slide. Now, what is this object of meditation? The object of meditation is invariably connected to, in the triangle, the apex of the triangle indicated the cause of the creation. The object of meditation is that cause. The total, I am the individual connecting to the total. That is called Saguna Brahma or Nirguna Brahma. Saguna Ishvara is called the Lord with attributes. And Nirguna Ishvara is Brahman, the reality of which is the reality of the self and the universe. There are other terms for it. Saguna Ishvara Dhyanam is called also Upasana, Manasakriya, mental activity. Nididhyasanam is called Atma Dhyanam, which is where the object of meditation is Nirguna Ishvara the object of meditation becomes the subject itself, which is what we are going to attempt a bit later. One needs to have a clear understanding of the self in order to do this practice, and as taught by the Upanishads. And one does this kind of meditation after a certain period of exposure to the scriptures, and after a certain period of inquiry into the self. There are certain obstacles to meditation, which is in the next slide. One should be cognizant of that and make corrections. The primary obstacle is nidra or sleep. If, you know, if I shut down all the lights when we do the practice, and then I ask you, close your eyes, it's a possibility. You can go into sleep. There are three things that cause sleep. First, deficit in sleep, nidra sesha. That, you know, you, you, you have not caught up with sleep because you are working very hard or whatever. And at that time, if you sit down for meditation, eventually you will sleep. The next one is very obvious, too much food. 
Of course, somebody mentioned about one of the good things that are coming out of these congregations. <laughs> so if you are going to be practicing meditation or today or later or tomorrow, so you might want to watch that. Tiredness of the body, you are working too hard, the shrama, then also the body will go into sleep. Vikshepa, wandering of the mind, due to either inactivity or overactivity caused by tamokuna and rajokuna. These are all, these are the two major obstacles. On the right side I have given what you have to do to remedy them. Of course, avoid causes of sleep. Bring the wandering mind back to the object of meditation. And the last one is the best. Sheer practice. Benefits of meditation. Relative serenity and equipoise of the mind. Prepares the mind, gives you that concentration, one-pointedness of the mind. Chitta egakrata. Then, with that mind, a committed self-enquiry for a continuous length of time leads to self-knowledge, the content of I, the self, thereby to the discovery that one is the nature of fullness. Just like the sugar crystal's nature is being sweet, the nature of the self is happiness. You are the source of that happiness. So now we will attempt to do a practice. What I would suggest is switch off these lights a little bit, if it's possible. Sit straight in a posture that is comfortable to you. I mean, that's important. Sukham stiram asanam. And keep your head, neck, and the trunk as much as possible in a straight line. Hands on the lap. Fingers intertwined, thumbs touching each other. Close your eyes. Close your eyes softly. And the closing of the eyes should be done consciously. Open your eyes and softly bring the upper eyelid to touch the lower eyelid. Remember the picture of Buddha that I showed you before. There are no creases or lines on that upper eyelid. Open your eyes, gently close, bring the upper eyelid to touch the lower eyelid. Do it consciously. Be awareful of the fact that there are no lines on the upper eyelid. Do it once more. Open your eyes, gently bring the upper eyelid to touch the lower eyelid. Sport a smile. The meditator is the basic conscious person who assumes different roles. 
daughter or son with a reference to parents, brother or sister with a reference to siblings, neighbor, friend, student, teacher, citizen, etc. All these roles are relative, meaning they are born of a relationship. Unrelated to all of them, who are you? Is the basic person related to someone? If at all, the basic person is related to the total. You highlight this relationship in meditation. First, to arrive at the basic person, we will do the following three steps. We will start with visualizing your own body. Visualize the entire body part by part. Visualize the top of head, forehead, eyebrows, eyelids, nose, lips, chin, right ear lobe, right cheek, left ear lobe, left cheek the whole face, back of your head, neck, right shoulder, right hand, all the way down to the fingertips. Visualize the left shoulder, the left hand, the fingers. If there is pain anywhere, recognize it and proceed. Visualize the chest, the abdomen, and the back. The right side, left side. The waist, below the waist. Imagine, visualize the right thigh. The knee, below the knee. The ankle, the foot. Visualize the left thigh, the knee, below the knee, ankle, foot. Visualize. You are objective to your own body. You are objectifying your own body. Visualize. The simple conscious being is very objective to the body just in the same way he is objective to the external world. Now shift your focus from the body, we get into ourselves by watching our breath. If watching one's breath is difficult, breathe in and breathe out deliberately. Watch your breath, the inhalation and the exhalation. 
be awareful of the sensation on your nostrils. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Watch your breath. This is the most efficacious way, efficacious method. If one is agitated or excited or angry, watching your own breath, it's a good practice to do this daily when you are ready to retire to bed. Now, shift the focus and watch your mind. Watch the thoughts that occur in the mind. Do not judge them. Do not attach any labels to the thoughts that occur in the mind. Just observe the thoughts as they occur. The one who observes the thoughts in the mind is you, the simple, basic, conscious being. The one who is related to the Lord, the total, like the tree in a forest is related to the forest. Just by being a tree, it is related to the forest. It does not have to establish the relationship between itself and the forest. With the fellow trees, it is related, like a brother tree, sister tree, or whatever. Among the trees, there is a relationship, but all the trees are related to the forest in the same way, the individual to, to the total, the individual is related to the Lord. Think of an altar. Invoke the total in that altar. If you wish, you can invoke your form, but recognize it is just one of the forms. In the form you invoke, you have included all the forms of the Lord. 
think of the altar. Place a flower mentally at the altar. If you wish, you can say your own prayer. Place a flower at the altar. O oh Lord, grant me the serenity to accept gracefully what I cannot change. I seek the strength of will and the ability to make proper, adequate efforts to change what I need to what I can. The difference between the two, what I can and cannot change, is not easy to distinguish. It takes wisdom, for which I invoke your grace. O oh Lord, I am just awake, alive, to this moment, I lay down my will, my choice. I am just awake to this moment. I am awake to your presence, a presence which is always present. Acknowledge you are comfortable being yourself. Acknowledge. Say it mentally in so many words. I do not need any comforting from outside. I am comfortable as it is with myself. The free will is a luxury. Mind is a luxury. Emoting, doing, interacting, they are all a plus. Being the bare self, there is adequacy. I am comfortable being myself. Acknowledge. Shantish, Shantish, Shantihi. Just relax, but keep your eyes closed. You may stretch your leg or hand or whatever. Move around a little bit in your seat. Keep your eyes closed. When you go back to whatever you do later today, keep this moment of being yourself with you. You may open your eyes. 
ഓം പൂർണമത പൂർണമിതം പൂർണാ പൂർണമുദക്ഷതെ പൂർണശ്യ പൂർണമാദായ പൂർണമേവാവശിഷ്യതെ ഓം ശാന്തി 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 ഹരി ഹോം ശ്രീ ഗുരുഭ്യോ നമഹ ഹരി ഹോം ഓം തത്സത് ബ്രഹ്മാർപ്പണമസ്തു കൃഷ്ണാർപ്പണമസ്തു താങ്ക് യു now have an opportunity for some questions okay <clears throat> can people hear me okay or no yes okay so as you recover from that beautiful experience um we have an opportunity for some questions anyone somebody up there okay. <clears throat> pass that to boris okay. there we go thank you we're, we're back in the real world <laughs> that will up <laughs> keeping the eyes closed yeah the closing thank you the 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 process process of closing first of all it has to be done deliberately and suppose if i say uh, close the eyes just if i phrase it like that the tendency would be to immediately close the eyes like that so therefore i say softly close it so putting that softly before that verb that verbal action of closing it gives you the deliberation and the softly closing of the eyes without the wrinkles on the upper eyelid it gives you the concentration that i need for the rest of the process so it, it's a very important step cl- that closing of the eyes and it uh, two things it has to be done deliberately and number two with practice we make sure that there are no strain so there are no lines in that upper eyelid so that is the that's what depicted in the buddha buddha statue the sculptor made that statue as brought that out so beautifully and also the eyes are not completely closed you keep the eyes little bit open but at the same time it's not focusing on anything specific so that's the process i hope it's answering that question yeah that is you are still fully see the purpose of meditation of course ultimately is even after uh, in, in in other words this this absorption of the mind is should be should eventually take place in the presence of various other activities so for example e- even though the eyes are partially closed indicating of course one important thing you have that is so that i don't go to sleep that's number one and number two is i am still aware full of my surroundings in spite of suppose let's say i sit down and the eventually the practice is suppose i sit down and half closed or partially closed and then i then somebody uh, somebody uh, clears their throat or somebody sneezes 
some, uh, you know, uh, and of course if somebody goes to sleep, you might you also hear snoring. All that should not disturb. That is why I made the point, if any thought comes to the mind, don't judge that thought. Suppose, as an example, I close and I'm doing meditation, like now a cell phone rings. <laughs> this is the inevitable, uh, what should I say, blessing of humanity. I want to say the other thing, but uh, <laughs> so, here in this congregation, I don't want to bring out those words. <laughs> It, 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 it happens. But at that time, I do not allow myself to be disturbed. I will be disturbed if I attach a label that it is the ringing of a cell phone. Then the mind will immediately see, who is this? <laughs> then put it in the vibrate mode. All the judgments will happen. If I just only say, alert to myself, that I am the hearer of that sound, no labels attached. That frees you, it frees you, gives you that freedom not to associate yourself with that. That's the power. In day-to-day -day life, in any interaction, <coughs> we normally react impulsively because we don't have the distance, the space, the mental space that you need before one reacts. You have, one has to gain that mental space. I just hear a sound. I am the hearer of the sound. I don't label the sound, it is snoring, it is sneezing, it is coughing, it is cell phone, what have you. I am just an awareful being, conscious of that sound, the sound which is objectified by the simple conscious being. That gives you the distance. I have a, a question too um, about the t better time of day to do meditation. From what you suggested, doing it before going to sleep is a good idea and I, I would love to believe that that might help me with my sleep problems. <laughs> what do you think? The best time to do meditation <clears throat> is in the morning. In the morning as you get up and finish or whatever, and please don't drink any caffeine before <laughs> sitting on meditation. So you might have a cup of hot water, not cold water, just lukewarm or hot water that you, you know, the heat that you can bear with, drink that, then do meditation. It's quiet, so choose a quiet place in the house, and the best time is to do in the morning. One can do before retiring to bed also, but at that time you would have eaten your meals and it could be coming in the way of meditation. But eventually, eventually, with the practice, one should be able to do what I call it as walking meditation. As you conduct your life, you are in meditation because you have the distance. Sir, that's it.
Let me. <laughs> and somebody asked me one time, is it my arm and it, it, it can be gone? I won't say I dream it gone. I don't know what I some one word like how I can say if if I understood your question, uh, I couldn't hear all of it, but let let me paraphrase it, see whether this is correct. Y your question is, what do I tell others what I is? Is that myself, oh you okay? What okay? If I give it in one, allow me one sentence. One <laughs> word is difficult. <laughs> Whatever you objectify is not I. You think about it. That's yeah. all. Whatever you objectify is not I. <laughs> okay, hmm? Whatever you objectify. <clears throat> right. I gave you the answer. Sorry, that's it. Right. <laughs> this is meditation 101, recognized. Too. Please. I have a question. Yeah. Prerequisites for meditation. Thank you. It, it, it's a catch-22. You have to have a relative equipoise, a relative, even simple thing like setting priorities that I will do meditation regularly at 6 a.m. in the morning, 6 a.m. every day. That's a priority. So, simple things, you start with simple things. Then as you build up this mental stamina, if you will, then it grows on you. It's, it, you, it's, it's correct, it's a catch-22. You can't have the qualifications and start. But as you start somewhere with a modicum of these qualifications, then it builds up with time. Dennis? Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I have, I think, a very basic problem. And that is, how do I stay awake? <laughs> what is, am I approaching it wrong? Am I in the wrong state of body? My body is uh, at a fire and I should sleep? Or, you know, what, what is it that always gets me so relaxed that I, right. that I fall asleep? It, it, that's, that happens, and that's why I said, uh, you know, uh, the obstacles, one of the big obstacles is the nidra or sleep and which could be due to those three factors that I mentioned. So try to avoid those factors. If you are tired, if the person is tired after days of hard work and whatever, and uh, you need to sleep, sleep, don't do meditation. Don't do meditation. So it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's a practice that one has to do it deliberately. And uh, you can skip a few days if it's not possible because you are working hard or whatever. Um, but the idea is that I should be awake when I'm meditating. And one has to, that's why sheer practice, all this comes with practice. On day one, it's not going to happen. Day two, it's not going to happen. It takes time, time and practice. And the approach and have that confidence that I'll be able to do it that Atma Vishwasa is very important. That I'm not able to do meditation is one of the obstacles for meditation. We have time for about two more questions. We'll make it three. One, two, three. Oh, absolutely. I have uh, given it to Dr. Madhav, so you can get it from him. Yeah. Second question is, why do you meditate? Even for me. I cannot memorize all the time. Is there any recording you can play? 
since, yeah, since this was a guided meditation I was speaking to guide the process, in the Arshavadya Gurukulam there are tapes, guided meditation tapes of uh, Puja Swami Dayananda Saraswati and other Swamis which you can uh, take advantage of. That will give you the process in the beginning, after that you can grow out of it, then you know what to do. Oh, okay. Sure, I have no problem. And two more questions, Madhav? Yeah, that was my question. Oh. I In the beginning you need guided meditation. You, you need someone to guide you in the process. The whole, the whole approach here is, is to grow out of or recognize all those places where I is erroneously placed. The body, the mind, etc. So if you had noticed, the technique was, of course we didn't have enough time to stay on any one thing long enough, but if you had noticed, I started with the body. That is, then I'm trying to guide you to visualize that body and the deliberate process of visualization is done purposely to show that you, the awareful conscious being, the subject, is objectifying that body. Then I shifted to the next level, which is the physiological function such as breathing. You are observing your own breath. That means you are objectifying it. And also there is recognition, very, very important recognition. The air outside is called air. When it goes in, it gets the name breath. But there is absolutely no difference between the breath and the air outside. So this gives you the opportunity to relate the individual to the total. Then I shifted to the mind, watching your thoughts in the mind. Again, you are objectifying it. That means you are not the mind. So this is the levels. So one can stay with at the body level for a period of time, a length of time, then grow out of it go to the next step, etc. So this, for this beginning you need some guided meditation. And last question. The, the challenge that I have with meditation is that uh, when I start doing the meditation, I can keep the discipline for a certain amount of time. And then you start looking for the benefits. And when you start to see that maybe nothing has really changed then the motivation to continue the meditation starts to go down and it becomes very difficult to continue the practice. So what I'm wondering is, are there some things that we should be looking for, um, some changes in, in, in our life that will help to motivate us to continue the meditation? And if so, what is the period of time? Is it after one month, two months, three months, six months that we should start to see <laughs> okay, let, let me answer this in a politically correct way. <laughs> um, first of all, the benefits of meditation, if you want to see that uh, to, as a quantifiable measure so that you are motivated to do meditation, just examine. One, here one has to be honest to oneself. Just examine how the role playing is for you. How do you interact in, your, in the different roles that you play day to day? That's the measure. Starting with your spouse, your children, your friends, your co-workers. See how that role playing changing. That's the measure. The next measure is, you don't, there is no, again, if you allow me to say it, 
there is no secular meditation. Meditation, the object of the meditation, as I said, is the total, the Lord. It is how I relate to the total, the individual to the total. See how that is evolving for you. The third measure is, see whether one is able to live in the present, not in the past, or in the future. Please note, when you think of the past, it is in the present. And the past was a present. When you think of the future, it is in the present. And the future will be a present. See whether one can live in the present. That's the measure. Excellent. And since I said politically correct answer, let me tell you the not politically correct <laughs> answer. What is the, why do you want to put a, a measure? Why do you want to say I will do it in six months, if I don't get it, give me a you know, payback guarantee. <laughs> this is not like that. It's for you. What do you want to do something for you? I said, this is the quality time that you spend with yourself. You want to put a measure? You want to see whether there is any benefit? Whether I will get uh, a Nobel Prize? Or I will get a lottery ticket? Is that what? If that is what one is looking for, meditation is not the answer. <laughs> meditation is spend quality time with yourself to discover yourself. What is the need to put a measure? This is the non-politically correct answer. And I gave you the politically correct answer. Okay, okay. So now it's up to you. Okay. Thank we have, you. We have been duly challenged. So Liz, if you would do the closing and the formal thank you. Yes, we do really want to thank you. Dr. Swaminathan, you really have sparked an interest and were able to convey information in ways that I know I could understand and I'm sure others share that. So we really are grateful. Thank you very, very much. I, I would also like to thank the planners of this day, the champions who undertook the, all the arrangements, and they include Dr. Roshan Chada, Joe Ritaka, Mata Hotka, Sarmit Kanwal, Ari Jane, Stevie Lishan, uh, Patty White did the publicity. Uh, thank you, Liz Tortorella, for some of the arrangements with, uh, with the UU. And also to Mary Carol Day, who oversaw the table and the registration table along with Milton Zimmet. Thank you very much for what you did. We're very grateful for, to the hospitality we always receive here at the UU Congregation of Monmouth County and appreciate that. Um, I would also like to thank Bill McFarlane for his expertise with the media and also Paul Newland for the photographs and the recording. Uh, the board has been most supportive in all of these endeavors, but we're about to benefit from one of our board members is overseeing the refreshments. And we want to thank Georgette Thomas when we go into the community room and enjoy that. Uh, we would like to remind you of the wonderful events coming up, including our usual United We Sing Music of Gratitude, which is going to be on Sunday, 4 p.m., right here, and hope you will take brochures, flyers, and pass them around and invite friends and make this another truly day of celebration and gratitude. We also want to invite you to two other programs we're involved with, the Caravan Sarai, a group that's coming from Pakistan to share their music. Uh, we'll be in Monmouth County, and there are two events and two postcards, you can take these and uh, hopefully participate. 
uh, the Monmouth Center for World Religions and Ethical Thought. Uh, some of us are also members of the Monmouth Dialogue Group out of the, the Center for Global, the Institute for Global Understanding at Monmouth University. And this group is coming here for different residency programs thanks to a grant that they applied to, applied for. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, Joe is passing out feedback forms, right? And we really look at these forms. We really pay attention to what you have to tell us about programs and some feedback about logistical things. So do please take a few minutes and complete the forms. So thank you again for being with us. Um, and I've thanked everyone except the most important people in that view. You came and you participate. Is what what? I've I've kept it. <laughs> Yes, I did. Mike for the media support. Right. Oh also I wanted to thank Dr. Chatter for she really shared with us something about Shanti and Sri Ram Chata that I became acquainted with them in a new way in their, in their memory. And so we thank the Chata Family Endowment for supporting this program. So come and join us and in the community room for refreshments. Thank you. Okay.